Hi, Mickey. Hey, Bob. How you doing? I'm oh, fine. Look, it, it's uh, it's a famous actor. Wait, who is that? You know who it looks like, but isn't it? Look, it, it actually looks like kind of Sean Penn, but it's a different actor, right? Correct. But who but is I the, claim who is the famous it, actor who it turns out looks like Sean Penn? Who is that? The great actor who, like, I don't think won many awards. Famous yeah. for film noir. It's so going to be so embarrassing that I didn't that the name didn't come to mind. What, what's his name? No. Robert Mitchum. Robert Mitchum. Yeah. And I claim I claim that Robert Mitchum uh looks uh like which Sean is tousled hair like Ron DeSantis should look. Ron DeSantis has been in a couple of events where he's had windblown hair and he looks terrific. So he should adopt the secret of Boris Johnson and mess up his hair. Yeah. He doesn't have to he has to doesn't have to go full yeah miele or wherever that uh argentine guy is no but uh but uh you know a little more i, I think that's the only lower. missing ingredient yeah i think you're right i think that's the only thing that the DeSantis formula lacks is must up hair because he's got everything else there've been all these they've there've been all these postmortems you know about how he was scared of the press he didn't want to do the press he was arrogant uh, mm -hmm. He hired uh, all Ted Cruz's people for some reason, solely to prevent them from going to Glenn Youngkin. I don't think that's right, but uh, but this was the secret lying in plain sight. I mean, his hair is like is like greased down; it's nailed down. He needs to unnail it down. That's. Uh, I think you you hit it. Yeah. That, they, so I, you could make a, a good living as a political consultant, Mickey. I I actually, I actually tried that a little bit like yesterday it was a disaster oh did you so. well, we should say you are on the campaign trail you are in new hampshire following in the footsteps of the great hunter s thompson to whom many have compared you well i i i he 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 famously uh declared just complete it was a complete fiction i think that edward edwin muskie was an ibogaine addict remember that in uh well, that was when kind of obviously Muskie a joke. Pro it was uh, it was obviously a joke, but he extended it like you know, he didn't say it was a joke. He said, "I have to learn that Edward Muskie has become addicted to a powerful drug, ibogaine." And then, and then, of course, when Muskie cried on the, you know, allegedly cried he said, outside See? a newspaper in New Hampshire, he, he was crashing. He ran out of ibogaine. Now, it looked like he for a younger it viewers, like he was going through ibogaine withdrawal. Yes. For our younger viewers, we should say that Hunter S. Thompson wrote for the Rolling Stone, and part of his his so-called gonzo journalism was this kind of blurring of fact and fiction. I mean, you could kind of tell what the fiction was, but he would throw it in all the time. And, of course, he was no stranger to drugs himself, one might say, and uh, well, finally committed suicide. Uh, did he? Oh, yeah, oh, totally. And, and you know who he turned out to be good friends with? This is a tribute to... Walter Isaacson. Now, Walter Isaacson is a total establishment figure, but it turns out he had been hanging out with Hunter S. Thompson. You know why? Because he wanted to do a book about it. No, because Walter was president of the Aspen Institute. That meant he went to Aspen sometimes. And uh, where did Hunter Thompson live until he killed himself there? Well, the Gary Hart was a friend of Hunter Thompson, too. So was George McGovern. Uh, um, but... Um, so I thought I thought Ab Ibogaine was a fictitious drug, but it turns out it's no, a real it's drug. No, it's real, but but yeah, I don't think Musky was, yeah. Uh, anyway, but, but Hunter Thompson was on to the fact that Musky was a heavy drinker and was known for his temper fits ah. and emotionalism, and so it it fed into the press corps. And when Musky allegedly cried, they jumped all over Musky. So wait, that this was is, an wait, exciting. Wait, 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 whoa, 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 whoa! This is such a great segue. I can't pass it up. Okay, we got to move to Biden quickly. Just for a second, you'll get to do your well-prepared spiel. I mean, I know you were up all night preparing for this. We're not going to deprive you of that. Don't worry. Hold on. Listen, wait a second. Joe Biden, I have not given up my effort to dislodge him from the Democratic ticket. And I would just like to say something about, uh, oh, wait, was Muskie 72 or he was 68 or so? he was 72? So never mind. But I would like to use 72 as a segue <laughs> to 68, which is what I want to actually talk about. New Hampshire primary, 1968, LBJ, incumbent, 
who's who's getting some some blowback from the left wing of the party for some military activity that isn't popular on the left. So far as we know, he's running. He's going to be the nominee. Everything will work out wonderfully. However, uh, he barely won New Hampshire because Eugene McCarthy was contesting it. And what what did that? Little, do? Yeah, a relatively unknown Minnesotan. You might have. Oh, that's a good point. He was a Minnesotan, like Dean Phillips. This is this yeah. is folks again. This is the kind of magic that happens when Mickey and I talk. Um, so wait, now what did that do? It incur that close call among other things encouraged others to introduce to enter the race, including one Bobby Kennedy. Of course, in this this year, Bobby Kennedy is already in the race, but not the Democratic race. Um, and so that just opened the floodgates and it is, I mean, look, I'm not that optimistic and I suspect that it's harder to enter primaries late the way Bobby Kennedy evidently did, uh, now you, than, it, than it used to be. Ukraine is not, Ukraine is not Vietnam. No, there's, there's, uh, is, I'm thinking more about Israel. The blowback from the left is not about Ukraine. It's, it's about Okay, Israel. but the blowback, the blowback to Vietnam was nominally on the left but it in fact reflected a widespread disgust uh with vietnam um the and, analogy uh, the, is not perfect beyond, beyond the left and also um uh anyway the uh the uh democratic party now is much more disciplined than it was then and they you know they as dean phillips said the guy who's running against biden now who i still hold, hold out some hope might do better than expected, which expectations are are very low. They're council level low, 5%. Uh, that that, uh, that um, uh, what was my train of thought? My train of thought I know. was- I'll, I'll point out that Biden, while you're getting it, summoning it, I, I will say that uh, Biden is not on the ballot. Oh, so he Biden points out he was- be a writing vote. Yeah. Dean Phillips points out that as soon as he entered the race, he was excommunicated by the Democratic Party and it's just a much more, you know, disciplined, viciously uh, unified organization. Otherwise, otherwise, guy, guys like Pritzker would have jumped in, uh, you know. But uh, yeah, but Biden, but they know blowback won't be too severe. So well, he's he, with with an iron fist, he's leading his party over a cliff. Look, yeah, Biden is, uh, but you know, and since all those people made the decision not to run months and months ago. Things have come to look much, much worse for Biden in the general election. The polls well, lately there have taken... been some, some positive signs that the economy is looking up and eventually, uh, you know, voters may might get the message that things aren't going the all to hell. The poll numbers again. are bad. The, the, the Gaza thing, I repeat, I think has uh, enduringly reduced his ability to mobilize like young volunteers. Um, there's true discontent among young Democrats with that. And uh, we'll see. I mean, but my question is, could, is, is it too late for some big name uh, to jump in if, if Dean Phillips does better than we expect or something? Um, the answer is, I don't know. I've read a bunch of articles saying, yes, it's too late. Uh, but uh, I, I sort of never believe it's too late. So. Uh, and, and if Biden, you know, withdraws from the race, then the party has to do something. So yeah. uh, that's what I'm, I'm eating my Sudafed now. Just... Oh, you're taking your Sudafed. It's a little late to really perk you up. You definitely should snort oh. it. You definitely should snort it, Mickey. Oh. That would be ratings gold. You talk about your thumbs ups <laughs> on YouTube, which you should do, folks, just because he swallowed it so masterfully. But you really should. It's, only the, cheap, it's only the cheap Walmart Sudafed. Equivalent. One of the one of the virtues of being on the road in a car is that you go to Walmart and you realize what a fucking amazing store that is. Anyway, got a lot of stuff packed into you know. Also, it's incredibly cheap. It's just absurd. Anyway, yeah. that's how America has gotten by during the Biden years. Um, so that's Biden. Okay, I was thinking that the uh, you know basically. Basically, the lesson of the New Hampshire primary is it ain't what it used to be. This is a boring year. I'm I I may I may even leave town before the vote, uh, just because 
I've seen Haley. I've seen Haley twice, which is once more than I ever want to do. Uh, uh, I'm going to go see Trump tonight. Uh, once you see each candidate once, because they, I mean, Haley gives the same stump speech over and over again. She she doesn't even really improve it, which is the mark of a, uh, you know, not a not a very effective candidate. Um, uh, this is a you know the, the the reporters aren't here. I'll be amazed if anybody if if there's an influx even on election night. Uh, I haven't discovered the bar where all the journalists hang out in part because I don't think the journalists uh, really are here in any great numbers, and in part because I don't know any journalists anymore. But um, uh, so it's 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 not an exciting New Hampshire primary. Iowa is actually more exciting. Uh, the but what has happened is uh, that DeSantis is edging ahead of uh, Haley in Iowa has really put a damper on her momentum. If she had come in second in Iowa, I mean, it's very unfair that a few thousand votes separating second and third has a big impact, but it happens all the time, especially in, in Iowa. And uh, she hasn't come into New Hampshire with the momentum she might have had if she had done just a little better. Uh, and uh, so, you know, it's pretty clear that she's going to lose. Uh, and the question is just how decisively she will lose. And the, the positive scenario for Mickey is she loses so decisively and then goes down to South Carolina and loses decisively again there that that she leaves the race, leaving DeSantis as the only opponent. Uh, and uh, so DeSantis soldiers on, as I think he intends to do, uh, getting a few votes, getting a few delegates, uh, and then something happens to Trump and DeSantis wins. Yay! <laughs> because, because he's learned to tousle his hair. Does anyone other than you think this is possible? That is, is it you the, and DeSantis. Yes. I mean, this has been bandied about as his only, the only strategy that's available to him is is soldiering on. And then you know, it, it always it, they will say it always becomes the money problem. And it is true that DeSantis has been used to spending vast sums of money, mainly through his super PAC. Uh, which did pay off a bit. He he got five extra points beyond the the last polls because he had a superior ground operation. So that's not nothing. What do you want for a hundred and seventy hey, million? Hey, I just had a great idea uh, that it's it's too late for. But uh, you know, Haley refuses to debate DeSantis if Trump isn't going to be there because she just wants to completely marginalize him. So they canceled the debate. Why doesn't DeSantis debate Dean Phillips? Good for both of them, right? Win win. That is a good idea. Of course, it's a good idea. It's too late, but I was too suggest late. It. But that, so it's not a good idea. But it was a good idea. They should do it for. They're they're both gonna, I guess, Trump on down to South Carolina, right? I mean, the media, the media will will dismiss it as you know the Mickey Mouse debate among the. It's still also, also look, I'll bet. I'll bet they can find some some station to air it. Streaming. What? Twitter, what else? Anything. And what else do they have to cover? Right. Uh, uh, anyway, I went to I went to a Haley event. Uh, you know, she she has some capability of spontaneity. She bantered with the governor of New Hampshire, who mm. is her biggest supporter here. He's very popular. I sort of don't like him because he's like a you know conventional. Who is the governor uh, of New Hampshire? Uh, Sununu's son. Still Sununu. <laughs> His how, son. How long has he been there? No, I know the son, but the son's been in New Hampshire politics. It seems like he's been governor for a long yeah. time. Correct. Mm. Uh, anyway, so, uh, but 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 as soon as she goes on autopilot and starts the stump speech, uh, your sort of heart sinks. Even it, it, people who haven't heard her before, maybe their heart doesn't sink. But it's not a very good stump speech. It starts off talking about the debt and how we've accumulated debt, and isn't it time for an accountant in the White House? Okay, and that is so fucking that's, stupid. That's so stupid. And then eventually she gets to some good parts. She talks. The, the, the high point was she talks about, uh, you know, veterans care and the way to ensure vet, the good VA cares require congressmen to get their care from the VA. Uh, 
soon. Okay, you know, that, it's, that's it's a, a little good, but because it strikes a little bit of a populist core. These yeah. out of touch congressmen, yeah. they're yeah, that's not bad. Yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, and then she talks about the humiliation of us leaving Bagram Air Force Base in the middle of the night without telling our allies, which was humiliating. It doesn't explain how we got in that situation because we listened to the advice yeah. of people like and Nick I'm sure Haley. that's. I'm sure, that's, Afghanistan week long. I'm sure that's foremost on the mind of New Hampshire voters, right? Wish we'd gotten out of Afghanistan least, more. Aggressively. It was at least a human, it was a human uh, yeah, emotion just, she had. It's just, it's just, it's just up, come okay? on. You, you think campaigns are about the issues, they're about assessing the candidate, okay? I No, they're I about this stirring people's hating. emotions. You have to seduce the voters and convince them you're the person for them, okay? You can't just recite a list of issues and they're going to vote for you. Right. Um, and, and so you think they're thinking, yes, yeah, she'll get us out of our next uh, ill-advised war more gracefully or something. I mean, you know, no. Yes. Yeah, yeah. She, or we would still Americans be Americans do um, not care about foreign policy, Mickey. I, uh, w w doesn't this contradict your theory that Biden is going to lose because of Hamas? Well, young activist types who might otherwise uh, be volunteers in Biden's campaign, yes, a, a, a fair amount of them do care about that. But that's that's not a large fraction of the electorate. Oh. Uh, it, it, anyway, I, I I kept I kept thinking of you know. If I you mean, also that's a much more immediate issue. I mean, Afghanistan is yesteryear, you know. But go if ahead. you give a speech a hundred, well, that it's when Biden's popularity plummeted, though. That's whether I, I thought we should withdraw too, but whether you like it or not, that's when his popularity fell to the floor. Yeah, but that uh -huh. doesn't, Republican voters don't care when is fucking popular. Uh, never mind. We don't have to litigate it's this. It's a damaging but, issue if you're a Republican running against Biden. You bring up Afghanistan. I'm sorry. Even if it's old news, it's, it's, it's a, what, something that it's like Hunter Biden. Well, okay. So I guess. That's Biden to the quick. Kind of. I mean, to the extent that you attack Joe Biden, that's a good thing. I just don't know that this is the most resonant attack, and I'm sure she has others. Here's my anyway. question. Well, were you going to say more? Yes, I had two more points. Okay. Remember your question. Don't worry. Um, uh, if you if you even a big stump speech and your entire candidacy rests on it, or if you're a preacher in a church and just giving a speech on Sunday every week. You go for the most telling anecdote that's going to bring tears to your audience's eyes. Mm -hmm. And, and you know, I was thinking of, like, I heard Jason DePaul give a talk about his book about welfare people in Milwaukee. And he had some anecdotes that just ripped your heart out, okay? Yeah. And I, I, I think of them again, and I, I start crying again, okay? Haley had nothing to that. She had all the consultants in the world, all the money in the world. She didn't bother to come up with a good anecdote. So her candidacy is sort of uh, a couple of breaks shy of a load. The second thing is, of course, she talks about her husband coming back from Iraq and having PTSD, not and how uh, you know couldn't be around loud noises, didn't want to be in part of crowds, blah blah blah. And of course, there's also some under news in the campaign, which is the Nikki Haley sex scandal. Mm -hmm. How could New Hampshire not be exciting if there's a sex scandal? Answer it because the press is not reporting it because the entire sex scandal is just she had an affair with a couple of campaign aides when she was running for governor. Uh, and everybody decides that's that's not worth reporting. And I agree that's not worth reporting. Uh, somebody just. But it kind of undercuts the the traumatic. Uh, but, yeah. but, but she but, you know, with John Edwards, it was worth reporting. Because he was basing his entire emotional pitch of his campaign on his loyalty to his dying wife. Okay. In the quiet of a hospital room, we decided to run for president, blah, blah, blah. And women liked him because he was loyal to his dying wife, but he wasn't loyal to his dying wife. So if he's cheating on his dying wife, that's relevant. Okay. She's coming close to the line when she boasts about how she was loyal to her husband who was overseas. Uh, if you could show she was cheating when he was overseas, seems to me that's worth reporting. Uh, worth this story did not do that. It was not when he was overseas, but um, I don't think. But, you know, that's what she should emphasize. I've never cheated on my husband while he was overseas. 
That's exactly. what I would lead with if yeah. I were her. He put a lid on it. It's, it's you know, it's like, it's like no more, no more, no more sex till he comes back. Yeah. Uh, so what's your so third? Those point? are the two things I had to say. Oh, that's two. Okay. You didn't uh, know about the Nick, Nikki Haley sex scandal, did you? I didn't even know about the PTSD. Okay. Um. Um. So. Is she, is she giving Trump shit for getting her mixed up with Nancy Pelosi? I don't know if she's done that yet. My line is, my line was going to be there, but for the grace of God, go I. It's the sort of thing I would do, except clearly, it clearly it was worse than that because he had somehow fixated on Nikki Haley as the personification of evil. So he mentally substituted her for Nancy Pelosi. I think that's it. Yeah, I think he's got a, I mean, first of all, I want to read the quote because it wasn't just like one, you know, did you, did you see exactly what he said? I mean, I, it does I watched raise, the video. I watched the video. It raises cognitive issues. So, so because he says, okay, by the way, they never report the crowd on January 6th, you know, Nikki Haley, Nikki Haley, Nikki Haley says it three times. Did you know they destroyed all of the information, all of the evidence, everything deleted and destroyed all of it, all of it. Because of lots of things, like Nikki Haley is in charge of security. We offered her 10,000 people, soldiers, National Guards, whatever they want. So he says her name four times. Four times. I think that's weird. I'm sorry. I it mean. Seems, it seems it, it seems deeply addled, like he just woke up from a dream or something. Yeah. Like it, exactly. You know, but, like he's yeah. on drugs. And he and clearly he has a part that, that of his brain mistake. that is like women I'm trashing and don't really hate. And both and at least two women are in it. And they then there may be really subdivisions when that like name begins within. And he was in that part of the, <laughs> the basement. But uh, it was clearly the, it was clearly the women I'm, I'm trashing. Yeah. I, but it's I don't know if he really. Does he does he not like Nancy Pelosi? He really should not like Nancy Pelosi. She's really done a number on him. Well, in a way, I wonder whether he's not sufficiently psychopathic that he doesn't truly hate anyone, you know. But no, sometimes you, 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 I don't, it's hard to say. I don't know. Wait, if he's more psychopathic, he doesn't hate them? Well, psychopaths are just more clinical, supposedly. They're more like removed from their feeling. I mean, they do have okay. vendettas and so on and and hatred. But uh, I don't know. I, I don't know. my. I'm, I don't know. Uh, none of my none of my good friends are psychopaths, so far as I know. They are sort of. They're both. I want anyway. Nikki Haley is tiny. Have I mentioned that? No. She's she's she. The the reason the the phrase Trump calls her bird brain, the reason why that <laughs> resonates, is because she is like a little bird. She's looks her face looks sort of hawkish, mm -hmm. and she and she's she tiny. Hawk, she's like yeah. a little frail bird. Uh, huh. Although not, but hawks are not she, frail birds, Mickey. If she looks hawkish, and well, she, beak. She has a beak. She is hawkish, but, uh, but okay. you know, she's she doesn't look frail when she's talking, and you can't see how short she is. And she's pretty dynamic. But uh, anyway, um, well, so she's three, not going to make it. my choice and, would be DeSantis. Oh, I want to go on the record as saying that of those three, I would choose DeSantis. Thank you. The least bad, the least bad outcome. We should do. Um, he should embrace. The, he should embrace. Put in fingers. He should. You know that was that was the most telling Trump attack on him. I missed it. What was that? They, there was some quote in a Daily Beast story that he once ate chocolate pudding with his three fingers because he didn't have utensils, uh -huh. uh, and so Trump did this disgusting ad of this guy who wanted to cut Social Security with his pudding fingers, and it just looked like they had shit on them. His chocolate pudding was. Completely disgusting, but very effective. Mm. Uh, uh, and, but, I, you know, the thing to do when people label, you know, label you like that is to embrace it and turn it around. Totally. Flip, flip the script, as they say, in a phrase uh -huh. I never know what it means, but I think it would I think, mean I that. I think it's and, like uh, jujitsu. It's, it's like a jujitsu movie, yeah, right? He could have, he could have, uh, he could have embraced the, the put in figures and people could have held up their brown fingers at rallies, you know, the Santas, the Santas. It was, so, would have been great. 
don't you think that really, if you're going to be honest about the Republican race, which I know pains you because it means acknowledging that Ron DeSantis is not going to be the nominee and Donald Trump is, but if one were honest about the actual lack of drama in the Republican race, is it possible that there's actually more drama on the Democratic side this time? Because after all, I mean, Biden's not on the ballot. Apparently, they're encouraging write-in votes for him so that Dean Phillips doesn't beat him. Dean Phillips is on the ballot. Of course, there's John, 20 Johnson other people was, on the ballot, apparently. 20 other Johnson was a write-in candidate versus McCarthy, too. Um, oh, was the, he? Uh, yeah. The, um, you're right. I mean, everybody's really, everybody thought neither party likes this candidate. Uh, this is now the conventional wisdom. It's two days old. Mm-hmm. Mark Halpern had it two days ago, which is, uh, you know, or maybe it was John Ellis. I guess it was, maybe it was John Ellis. Anyway, somebody pointed out, you can't say neither party likes this candidate because the Republicans decided they like Donald Trump. So they have their candidate. The Democrats are the people who still hate their candidate. And, uh, and that's where the drama is. Yes. Um, what, what I wish we had is a Democratic challenger to Biden. Not even a super famous one. I mean, it could be, it could be Dean Phillips level, but who, unlike Dean Phillips, is actually positioned to give Biden some heat from the left on Israel, Gaza. That could stir up some action. You you would get a lot of volunteers helping you out right away. That would, you know, it, it's, a, it's a debate worth having. It would be good to put pressure on Biden to, to finally get around to actually trying to use some leverage with Netanyahu. I mean, that's my view why anyway. Couldn't, why couldn't Cornell West do that, I guess? Now he can't because he's, he's not taken independent. seriously. He's not, and he's an independent. He's not running in the Democratic side anyway, is he? Or is he? Is he? No, he's running as an independent. He's not running yeah. on the Democratic side. Marianne he, Williams, he, he, Williams or Williamson, whatever it is, she is running Williamson. on the. She's on the on the ballot, I think, and so is Dean Phillips, and so apparently are nineteen other people, if I understand it correctly. But Didn't you have Phillips, her on blogging heads. She was on blogging heads. As I told you, the, you know, there was a certain amount of obvious, you know, chemistry between, between Marianne and me. She was, I don't don't want to say she was smitten, but I think she was smitten. The high point of, of my trip, Bob, is I was in a bar in Des Moines and uh, I was staring at Carrie Lake and she smiled at me, Bob. Really? I thought something going on. That's amazing. Cause you know, politicians don't just go around smiling at anybody, you know? So you should be well, that's, like that's what I re- that's what I realized. Most normal people, when somebody stares at you, they'll stare back or walk away. If you're a politician, you'll smile at them. That's what politicians do, right? Yeah. So I have a related was- story that would be parrot room material, so I won't tell it. Um, but uh anyway, I think you should be required to be for Marianne Williamson just because you want to uh blogging I'm on, board. Person. I'm on board for her is she i just don't think i mean i think dean phillips has more of a you know he's actually in congress so people take him like a little bit seriously now i want to say some last yeah. week yeah go ahead well we each have our pet issues waiting in the wings you can talk about pressuring Netanyahu, and i could talk about biden's uh pathetic desperate attempts to uh save his ass from his immigration failure but go ahead well Phillips, what were you going to say for I want to say something about Phillips. I mean, last time uh, I was very dismissive of him and compared him to Ramaswamy. And I do think that comparison holds. I went back, but I, I, in fact, I'll he's, not an asshole like, he's not an asshole like Ramaswamy. No, but I mean, he's, he's a good talker who's good at pretty good at saying things that get people's attention and get him to go. Yeah, but it just doesn't add up. And he doesn't have any idea of how the world actually works. So he says crazy shit about what he would do as president. And I will actually play a recording of him saying what, in my mind, is some crazy shit in a second. But on the positive side, so I went back and listened to him on uh, the All In podcast. This was like a a, a couple of months ago, I think. Uh, And I will say, and as you know, he seems to be pro-engagement on China. I like that. And he even did say it was stupid of Biden to call she a dictator. I like that. Uh, he's got some good things, but it just, it, it just like, for example, he's like when, when uh, David Sachs brought up Ukraine, he says, well, you know, in the mistake, it was in 2014 
you know, Crimea is where we should have drawn a line. You know, we gave him an inch and now he's taking a mile. And and it's like and, and nobody followed up and said, wait a second, you're saying you would have gone to war over Ukraine? Like, how how would you have exactly stopped over that? Crimea, even worse than Ukraine over Crimea. No, I mean, Crimea. That's what I mean. Crimea. You would have gone you would have gone to war over Crimea. This is remember, Putin didn't even have to fight for it. The the, the sentiment. Uh, among both like officials and and reg and and the grassroots was so pro Russian that they just you know sent in a bunch of guys and power was handed over and like so right. what you're going to go occupy a country where you know most people actually were in favor of Putin running the I mean this is just crazy shit you're gonna the idea of going to war with Russia over Crimea okay but that's not what I want to play for you. I want to play for you the part where he's talking about. So this was some weeks after October 7th. And he says, so first of all, he says he's about to issue a statement demanding the release of the hostages. I think that's extremely courageous of him. And I'm sure that'll work. But I want to, uh, yeah, you know, we're talking about the, the Hamas hostages. Right. Uh, but I want to play the rest of it. Um, and uh, OK, so here we go. Missiles in Gaza and it's got to stop. Uh, I am about to issue a statement to that end uh, that says, essentially, uh, Hamas must release all of its hostages, period, of which there are nine Americans, guys. Nine Americans are being held in Gaza by a terrorist organization. And as president, I would be making that my, not my daily uh, desire or request, my daily demand, all hands on deck, these hostages must be released immediately. Would you send in special forces to collect them? I would, absolutely. It is the it is incumbent on the president of the United States to extract Americans being held against their will Why by any foreign it? entity. I don't know. Got to ask him. But good luck asking him because he doesn't do any press conferences. The goal for peace is, is reasonable, but but these like maybe some specifics around your your strategy. Know, so let me, uh, let yeah, me so, yeah, yeah. okay. So first, at the at the moment the hostages are safely released, there should be a ceasefire. Period. And at that very moment, there should be a multinational peacekeeping force sent into Gaza to maintain security immediately. When I say multinational, the very nations that are connected to Gaza, Arab nations, have to be part of it. Not the United States, not Israel, of course, but a significant force there to keep the peace immediately. Concurrently, a multinational coalition designed to eliminate Hamas by every nation in the world that wants them eliminated, which frankly is most. And then we have got to invest again. Nations of the world invest in I mean, where do I begin? Like he's going to send special forces to Gaza to ensure that the hostages get killed while along with a few of the special forces. I mean, you know, if that well, were doable, I think Israel would have done it. They know that territory pretty well. And they, you know, there's that. There's like multinational force, but not America to uh, occupy uh, Gaza. First of all, virtually nobody wants to do that. But 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 above all, a multinational coalition to eliminate what? So that's going to be a military operation. And I've got some bad news. There is no country in the entire region other than Israel that wants to be seen as trying to eliminate Hamas. There are right. rulers who would like Hamas eliminated, but there are none who are going to pony, you know, who are going to go on record saying, yep, here's our troops. Do your best. I mean, this is just fantasy land. Uh, correct. Um, it's 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 pretty immature for a politician to say that. Gene McCarthy, for a, in sharp contrast, would have never said anything like that. No, I know. Of course, I he, mean, had, he had a huge, big issue that he didn't have to really have to say anything about, which is Vietnam. He, he didn't have to say, "Okay, we're going to send a multinational force into Vietnam or come up with some right. crazy ass scheme." Uh, all he had to do was say, "We're going to end the war." Uh, but he was a sophisticated man who was way beyond that. No, it's uh, sad. I mean, we 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 deserve better. So that's why my hope is that uh, he will play the Eugene McCarthy role in the sense of doing well enough that it opens up the race. Although I'm sure that's fantasy land too, and it's actually too late for anything to happen. But it, Tim Kaine, I repeat, Tim Kaine is the guy, and he's also the guy to put uh, pressure on Biden. Over Gaza, he's already he's sponsoring resolutions along with a few other senators about Gaza. He's the guy, Tim Tim Kaine. Tim Kaine is just like Phillips's multinational force. It's your, your 
uh, delusion as to how this is going to end. Is, uh, Tim Kaine is going to march in and solve everything. No, but Mickey, you don't understand. They're, I'm issuing a statement today calling for him to enter the race, okay? But Does is, that change your mind? But but, but the, the search for the Kwisatz Haderach, the perfect Democrat who is uh, you know, ambitious enough to want to get into the race and distant enough for the Democratic establishment that he's willing to defy, he or she is willing to defy them, yet popular enough that he or she will uh, pose a real threat, is not, not crazy. I think maybe there is such a person out there. Uh, and the sad thing is they would maybe, probably beat Trump. It's not hard to find a somebody, candidate who can beat Trump. Maybe somebody in the entertainment industry, John Stewart. No, I think uh, we need somebody with political cred. We don't we don't need more celebrity bullshit. Um but you're you know, desperate celebrity bullshit gains new appeal. My final question to draw on your vast uh, knowledge of politics. If I mean it's an unpredictable path forward. Suppose things start looking hopeless for Biden, but he has amassed a lot of delegates. Um or for whatever reason, he decides, OK, I give up. He's just not doing well enough. He can. Can any candidate just release their delegates? Sure. OK, I that's think. my that's my um, new hope. It, but it has to be done at the convention. It's not going to be somebody jumping in before the convention and beating him. Now, uh, you know, in, in most in a lot of uh, presidential races, the winning candidate starts losing primaries toward the end. As there's a buyer's remorse, so I'm not. It's not crazy that DeSantis could be the recipient of a bit of buyer's remorse toward the end. Uh, his his mistakes really have been sort of tactical, putting all this money into a pack he didn't control. There's a lot of a lot of uh, the post board said he shouldn't have gone. He you know instead of declaring for president, he did a book tour, which is his fake declaration for president, where he could run around the country, but not mm -hmm. declare. And people said that just made him a sitting duck for Trump. Uh, he should have just declared. Uh, so he made a lot of mistakes, but they tended to be, he, he didn't give media interviews for a while initially, and then he realized that was a mistake. Most of his mistakes have been tactical, not in terms of governing or policy uh, or substance. So the basis for, a, and, you know, and, the, and he's getting better on the stump and better with people and et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, if John Fetterman can come back from his depression, Ron DeSantis can come back from his misanthropy. Um, and so this, I think it's possible that he has a resurgence toward the end. Uh, but I don't see, in on the Democratic side, I don't, unless you have a horse, I don't see a resurgence. Don't you remember when Jerry Brown started beating Jimmy Carter at the end of 1976? Because mm -hmm. uh, people sort of said, well, we don't, we're not sure we like this guy, Carter. And Brown won a, won a couple of primaries in a row uh, and, you know, it became a serious threat. Um, final final uh, hope is that, you know, there is a little bit of a campaign in New Hampshire to write in ceasefire in the, on the Democratic side. That's your candidate, right. ceasefire. But I write in no fully refundable child tax credit. Yeah, you can do that. Why don't you organize that on the Republican side? Okay, I have to switch my residency, but I'll do that. So um, the uh, the the, you know, the other factor hurting Biden is that all these Democrats are jumping in the Democratic, all these yeah, independents are jumping in the Democratic, they're jumping in the Republican primary to vote for Haley, so they're not around to vote for Biden. Well, it's mm -hmm. possible that people who hate Trump also hate Trump yeah. enough that they really worry about Biden, and they would just as soon vote for Dean Phillips. Phillips. Yeah. So maybe it's Rodney Phillips. Um, do you know who do you know who Dean Phillips is uh well step grandmother technically, but his uh his father died in Vietnam when he was six months old. So this is the only father he knows. And apparently I, this I father, knew that, but I've forgotten it. Dear Abby. Dear Abby is the correct answer. You know, the, the famous Dear Abby was his stepfather? No, was the mother of the stepfather, I think. He because he says that. Dear Abby is his grandmother, and uh, Ann Landers is his aunt. They are sisters, of course. Yeah. Dear Abby and Ann Landers. Yeah. No, he, he married into a liquor. I mean, his mother married into a liquor family. 
Phillips Schnapps. The guy who secret who ghost wrote Dear Abby lived down the street from me. Um, you know, she had writers. Um, uh, so um, anyway, it's um, we're still in exactly the same dilemma we were uh, a year ago, except the dilemma is congealing around our ankles like cement. Now we're uh, screwed. Uh, I mean, we broadly, America, the world. And so on. Um, um, should we, so should it, we? Uh, it, yeah, you want to talk? I'm, I want to say more about foreign policy, but you want to talk about immigration first. Yeah, no, I'm trying to think of this. You know, the the Biden the Biden problem is really the Kamala Harris problem. Mm -hmm. I mean, even I would stomach four more years of Biden if if you could press a button and guarantee he would not never cede his presidency to Kamala Harris. Hmm. Um, so I think people should focus on that problem rather than the anti-Biden problem. Well, I just like between Ukraine and, and Gaza, I just, you know, it's just turning out that his foreign policy is as is, is bad as anybody else's it by my lights, by my ideological lights. And so. Well, let's, well, let's, let's talk about that. You said, uh, Biden could finally use leverage with Netanyahu. Well, hasn't he used all the leverage he has? He's been trying. He used no leverage. He used oh. none. No, I mean, the th see, this is the thing. We are so conditioned to politicians, you know, walking, respecting the political guardrails on Israel that we, we never imagined them actually using leverage, Okay. We are providing all of the weapons and the ammo that they're using. Now, there's enough in the pipeline that they could keep going for a while, but I guarantee you that. I mean, let's just imagine a world where you didn't consider Israel the third rail and could actually use the kind of leverage that we associate with superpowers and, and supposed client states, right? I mean, mm -hmm. what you do is, you know, you show Netanyahu a statement that you're going to make if he doesn't do X, Y, and Z and the state, uh, for example. And, and here's, I, I want to say uh, one thing while uh, folks, Mickey has disappeared and doing, he's doing God knows what. Um, I mean, we'll be dialing 911 if he doesn't show up soon. Um, the, uh, well, let me first of all say the kind of thing you, well, two things you might do, you know, uh, you, you might, Say, uh, well, no, I, I, here's the thing that's not appreciated is that Biden could get tough with Israel in certain ways and really not court nearly as much trouble as he apparently fears from the Israel lobby and, and certainly not from Jewish voters, uh, by and large, or, or at least the ones who would vote for him anyway. Um, and, uh, and that is. That has to do with the fact that Bibi Netanyahu is very unpopular among Israelis, among American Jews, and so are the people on the right wing of his cabinet. So if Biden wanted to say, look, uh, you know, these guys, Smotrich and Ben Gavir, they are saying they want ethnic cleansing, okay? And almost in so many words, it's very clear. And I want them to both renounce it. And if you don't get them to do it, I will do X, Y, and Z. Now that battle he could go public with, okay? And it wouldn't, it wouldn't hurt him much. I mean, I don't know what actual elements of a literal like APAC and so on would do, but in terms of like uh, don donors, I think by and large and whoever the hell else he cares about. Um, That's so that's the worst of both worlds. You're meddling in a country's politics, which you have no business doing, and you're not stopping the war. So Netanyahu no, no, fired no, no, no. Uh, look, with the war. You, you ask how much leverage there is. Okay, here's what leverage would be. Again, imagine, for, okay, let's go back to the world where there's no political guardrails. You, 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 you might first show BB this statement you're going to deliver, and then you would actually deliver it if he didn't, uh, you know, whatever. Uh, the statement is, look, we have some some problems here. Uh, actual cabinet members seem to favor ethnic cleansing, okay? And and their plan for Gaza is to actually relocate all the Gazans 
And uh, we can't put up with that. So I am suspending the flow of weapons to Israel for one week and see if if anybody will reconsider. I, now, will Biden do that? No, I'm just saying that's how you actually would use leverage if you, if you weren't uh, deathly afraid of what the political uh, blowback would be. I mean, even. But it's not. It's, is it? Is it? It's not Israel's policy to relocate the Gazans yet, is it? It's just. It's just these guys. No, no. You thing. would say, look, I, I am not going to send weapons to a government that is conducting this war in Gaza, Gaza, and includes cabinet members who are saying this. So either, so I'm, I'm waiting for them to renounce it. Now this. This might lead to the fall of the Netanyahu government, which, by the way, most American Jews would love. OK, they would love that outcome. And so would most Israelis. So so that's I'm, I'm just saying to the you know, there, there are certain kinds of issues to the extent that it looks like a war between Biden and Netanyahu. That's not a very unpopular thing in the community he's worried about. OK, and the uh, but, I, I, you know, you could equally well say, look, they just are not being we've, we've asked again and again to be more careful about civilian casualties, to pause the fighting and let more stuff in. BB keeps saying no. So we're going we're gonna to pause the flow of weapons and just wait and see what happens. That would be a fucking earthquake in Israel, okay? That would be an earthquake. And it would probably lead BB to either do whatever Biden said he wanted him to do or to fall, okay? The government would fall because, and, and but Biden, you know, so, but but again, do, and don't come back and say, but wouldn't that hurt Biden? I'm telling you right now what the leverage is. I, do I think Biden is, is, I'm not denying there's political blowback. The Israel no, lobby is I'm powerful. Not, I, I'm not, I, I wasn't going to say that. I, I, I'm, not, I'm not sure that the political consequences are what Biden fears. I think he's, he's, he's doing sort of what he, you know, what, what the blob believes should be done. Well, that's fearing the political that's a form of fear of the political consequences. The blob exacts penalties. But I, but see, the, well, the blob, blob is... The blob might feel that this is like Russia's invasion of Ukraine. What Hamas did cannot go unpunished, so you got to let the Israelis punish it. The blob's not nearly as unified on this issue. There are lots of actual blob members who would love to see a ceasefire. Lots. Now, they, they may not That's say it. Article. Well, you can I illustrate it with like a blob dividing in two. Yeah, uh, it, it, it's it's actually a good point. You can, it's a, it's a point worth making. The the blob uh, is divided. On, you know, they're not super vocal about it, um, but there are not many people vocally defending what Israel is doing right now in America. Foreign policy elites. There are always Arabists in the blob. What does that mean? It wasn't the standard objection to State Department realists was that they were all Arabists who just went over to Saudi Arabia and got taken in by the Saudi worldview, which is well, not pro. But the time was that's much, what the pro-Israel people said. Much, yeah, much less pro-Israel than it is now. What about this McGurk story that I sent you? You mean the, by, the Huff Post issue, or yeah, yeah. I mean McG McGurk. I gather is the. You should explain who McGurk is because I've sort of Brett forgotten. McGurk, um, he was in, I guess, in was he? In, he was in Trump's administration, wasn't he? And he's. Uh, I, think he quit, I think he quit Trump's administration in in protest against our abandonment of our Syrian positions. I may be well, wrong. That says it all. And, and Biden, for whatever reason, has given him some Middle East portfolio in the White House. And he is, according to the uh, reporting in HuffPost, and I think the White House said about kind of trying to slime the reporter who wrote this, but um, ac according to various reporting, I mean, McGurk is very influential in driving the policy. And there, there was a, a HuffPost piece that said that he's, I don't know, but just pushing this extremely hawkishly pro-Israel stuff. I don't remember the details. Is that what you said? Did you send me the post piece? Or? Well, I thought he's, he's, he's basically, his solution to the problem is let's let's rev up the, oh, the uh, Abraham Derek Accords. Kirchner, Abraham Accords, right. where right. it's all, there's a Saudi-Israel alliance and, and, and maybe including Iran, but, uh, no, but, but I don't think so. Now, no. 
No, the whole the whole point of the Abraham Accords is to is to alienate okay. and exclude Iran, and it's yeah. Okay, but it seems to me it was Saudis, Israel, and somebody else. Maybe well, it could be the rest. I mean, who who has not yet signed on to the normalization? I as UAE, I forget which countries have uh, have already signed on to the Abraham. Accords. Is there any hope of splitting Iraq off of Iran? No, I don't know. I mean. You know, I, I don't know. Iraq has lately been demanding that we leave the country, but of course, <laughs> we never do. Um, our troops uh, are, are apparently not not welcome there. Um, it's getting complicated. You know, there was this uh, dust up between Iran and Pakistan, which seems to have been resolved, uh, perhaps with the behind the scenes uh, intermediation of China which continues to be the only great power that ever plays a constructive role in the Middle East. They had also brokered this rapprochement between Iran and Saudi Arabia and, and Biden's intense desire to revive the Abraham Accords and, and, and you know, embrace and extend them and, and get Saudis on board with that was, I think, partly a reaction against that kind of thing. You know, China does something constructive and just to show them who's boss, we do something that's not constructive. Wait, uh, if, if Iraq asks us to leave, shouldn't we leave? Well, Syria would like us to leave. Are we leaving there? No, we don't leave countries uh, that, we're, that we're occupying. Uh, but that's not answering the question. You were saying we should leave Syria too, huh? Yeah, we should leave both. If if Iraq really wants to go, we should leave. If Sy we should have left. We should have never entered Syria. Barack Obama said, "Don't worry, no boots on the ground." You know, a few weeks or months later, boots on the ground, uh, and uh, that's our foreign policy. Uh, one more thing um, is this: this Houthi thing is nuts. I mean, it's like all the all the Houthi experts. Um, I mean, hours before the Houthi attacks, and I, there was a thing about this in, in uh, my non-zero newsletter. There's two consecutive pieces about Houthis, actually, in the last two issues. Um, but hours before we decided to attack Yemen and hit the Houthi positions, uh, Mark Leon Goldberg on his Global Dispatches uh, newsletter had uh, an interview with this uh, guy, Gregory Johnson, who's one of the big experts on Yemen saying, you know, the Houthis are trying to bait someone into attacking them because that's good politics for them uh, because they are having trouble governing. They're not great at governance. They now run, they now occupy a lot of Yemen and things only work out for them when they have an external enemy. So they're trying to get somebody to strike them. And, you know, Biden delivers and it's a completely hopeless task because uh, you know, it, it's interesting that from the get go, the U.S. did not say we're doing this to deter the attacks on shipping in the Red Sea because they know it's not going to deter. They said we're doing it to degrade. Well, degrading capabilities makes sense, like if it's a long drawn out war and every inc increment of degradation helps. But if your adversary's only goal is to disrupt shipping, Degrading doesn't help because disrupting shipping isn't that hard. I could disrupt shipping in the Red Sea. It's just, it's just not that hard. You've got to like invade and occupy if you're going to keep them from disrupting shipping in the Red Sea. So it's just a totally hopeless and stupid intervention. So you just we're supposed to sit idly by and let shipping no. be disrupted? No, we're supposed to say to BB, and this is the amazing. This is just the mind blowing thing about this. Okay. Biden, again, using no actual leverage to get BB to cease and desist and just do a fucking ceasefire. When the Houthis started doing disrupting commerce, they said, you know, until a ceasefire, we're not going to stop. And all of this other shit that's got people worried about a wider war, almost all of it uh, is a function of the ongoing war in Gaza. But it would not occur to anyone in America that, well, then maybe what we should do is stop the fucking war in Gaza, much less that we actually do have the leverage to well, put real pressure the, on Israel. And the Houthis will have won. Who fucking cares? The, the uh, uh, you know, and then, and then next time Israel uh, launches an epic war, they'll do it again. Well, we've got bigger problems on our plate. Now, I want to add a lot of, some Houthi experts say 
that the Houthis have now gotten so much reinforcement for this and the control of Iran over them is so overstated that it may be, I don't know, that now a ceasefire would not lead them to stop. But I don't quite uh, understand why you, your premise that there's no way to stop the Houthis. I mean, no, there is a way. If, stop the war. Well, there was they, a every, way. Every, but no, no, no sort of unilateral way. What, what, uh, what if every time somebody launches a drone, a, a, a missile rains out of the sky and kills them? It's just a technological issue, right? We, we, we I mean, it's, it's not hard to launch a drone. It is in the nature of drones that nobody has to be near the place they're launched from. Right. If the, and these attacks are from drones? Some are. Some are missiles. Uh, aren't there... What about sophisticated anti-drone technology that n knocks them out of the sky with the lasers? Well, the pro <laughs> you should send them some lasers. That might do it. But right now, what is happening is is we're is we're using missiles that cost a jillion dollars each to blow away drones that cost a dollar fifty, and that and that is the absurdity of that is one thing that drove Biden to try to take out the the like the launch sites or something. But, um. You know, and, and even, uh, you know, the missiles they use are much cheaper probably than our anti-missile missiles. But it's just like it's it's been so obvious that, like, if Biden were at all responsible, if he were the kind of president who worries as he should about, for example, the fact that America is more likely to suffer terrorist attacks, both targets abroad and at home because of the war in Gaza and because America's like the big supporter and supplier of it. If he were a responsible president in that sense, if he were responsible in the sense of trying to keep this from spinning out of control, if he were humane enough to care about all the civilians getting killed in Gaza, uh, then he would put actual pressure on Israel to end the fucking war. And he hasn't if done you, a bit of that. If you were writing this article, you would begin by talking about the Barbary pirates, right? Because there we sent, I mean, it was an easy, it was a simpler world. Shipping was being interfered with right. by these pirates. Right. Uh, we sent the fleet uh, with Admiral Decatur, I believe. Uh, and I also think his brother. Uh, and they sailed into the, boldly sailed into the port uh, in Libya yeah. and was now Libya. And boom, it was over. We. You know, they were, there was hand-to-hand -hand yeah. fighting on the ship, and we killed the key guy, and the threat yeah. was gone. Yeah, pirates uh, are stoppable. We remember we did that once uh, about, I don't know how many years ago. Uh, I think it was during the late Obama. But, you know, we, we, we stopped the pirate problem by just killing some pirates. That's because um, those are human beings trying to board your ship. Well, they didn't have drones. I think it's a technological issue. Well, they didn't have drones, but drones aren't enough to commandeer a ship anyway. They can only destroy, you know, they the can drones damage. are enough to disrupt commerce. So they exactly it was not it was it was not just piracy. There's a right, Chris right. Hitchens. This is the best uh, the best chapter in Chris Hitchens's book, which should still be a movie called Decatur, where Thomas Jefferson sent an ambassador to, I think, London to talk to some uh, Barbary Coast authority saying. What, and say, what gives you the right to board our ships and impress our sailors? And the, this ambassador said, Islam. Islam gives us the right. So it's not just piracy. There was some ideology there. Uh, and so it's not completely dissimilar to what's going on now. Well, the key dissimilarity is it was piracy, not drones. That's the reason what Biden's doing is funeral, uh, futile. This is drones and, and, and missiles. And you're just not going to entirely wipe out the infrastructure they need to you know, everyone is is saying this. And uh, the last thing I'll say is the irony is everyone is coming to realize that what's going on now isn't even in Israel's interest, slowly coming to realize this. Um, there was a piece I think, today in The Times uh, saying that, yeah, there's more and more of a consensus in Israel that there's no way to, quote, eliminate Hamas without getting all the hostages killed. And so they're starting to rethink. Um, um, it, 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 there, surely there's some other t other targets that Houthis uh, value that we could destroy. I guess then we turn into 
MBS uh, conducting a war against the Houthis. Yeah, and they endured that. They endured it and thrived during it, okay? I mean, politically, the Houthi leadership. The whole problem in the world is that it is often in the interest of political leaders to foment conflict. It's in Bibi's interest right now to foment conflict. It's in, well, Hamas thought it was. They may have overplayed their hand. Uh, but, but you know, that's that's Putin. what leaders do. Putin. Yeah, and to some Putin. extent. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay. Um, uh, okay, I've over calmed to down. Bobby Horst. What's that? Yeah, I, I, I'm now... Uh, I've now I'm now sedated enough to endure some immigration talk. Shoot. And then, and then I have a killer I have a killer transition for later. Um well, yeah, the, we will find out. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, the so uh Biden wants to get Ukraine aid. Uh we we talked about this before. He had the idea that if I throw in fourteen billion dollars for the border, maybe the Republicans will go for my Ukraine aid in the House. Uh, the Republicans, you know, uh, raised the stakes and said, no, we, this 14 billion is crap. We actually want some measures that will actually slow the flow on the border. So they've entered bipartisan negotiations in the Senate between uh, Senator Murphy, your favorite, and uh, Senator Langford and Senator Tillis, who are definitely not in my favorites. They're like very weak on immigration. And they're coming up with some sort of crap deal that now the press is, that Senator, that Speaker Johnson is rightly resisting. Uh, we don't, it's a secret deal. We don't know what's in it yet, okay? So everybody's talking and fulminating about a deal where we don't know what's in it, but we think what's in it, as I think I said, is some changing the standard from credible fear to reasonable fear to admit people in the country, proven to have a minimal effect, uh, some expansion of the zone in which you could do something called uh, some sort of rapid deportation, but it's not rapid. You still need a hearing, so it's not very effective. Uh, and not touching uh, the, the 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 parole authority that Biden has asserted to admit hundreds of thousands of people when previously it was, you know, a case by case admitting a few people at a time. So, um, or somewhere in between. Uh, so uh, it, it's a very bad deal. Johnson is resisting it, and the press is trying to put pressure on him. Uh, by saying, uh, uh, well, hardliners in the House are resisting a carefully negotiated bipartisan deal, putting Johnson in a jam. Well, there is no jam for Johnson. He's worried that the hardliners in the House are going to oust him. And if he, he resists this crap Senate deal, the hardliners will like him. So it solves his problem. It doesn't hurt him. Uh, the only jam would be if the, he can't stand the crit criticism of the uh, pro-Ukraine people and the press and uh, and the senators, which the, the whole job of a speaker is to resist the Senate. So um, I think he's up for it. Maybe he's not. But this is all going to play out in the next two weeks. I mean, uh, they haven't released it yet. So I guess the idea is to release it five minutes before they vote on it. But it'll eventually become public when they vote on it. Uh, and DeSantis has an opportunity here if he denounces the deal before Trump. Uh, it seems to be he wins some points. Now, he has already denounced the deal off the cuff on the stump. Trump has already truthed. He hasn't tweeted because he doesn't tweet. He truths. He's truth that th to Johnson that the deal has to be perfect. But he hasn't said he opposes it. He just said it has to be perfect before you uh, before you go for it. So DeSantis, there, there is a slight window. If DeSantis acts quickly, he can gain a few points. Uh, and, and Trump is sort of... Uh, uh, the danger is that if DeSantis comes out against it, Trump will, of course, will come out for it. Mm -hmm. um, just and, and and Trump is a is a weak read on immigration. That's one of the reasons I like DeSantis. Trump, you know, may decide, uh, you know, that it's uh, th 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 this will give him powers that he can exercise when he is president, which he expects to be. Uh, but so far, I haven't even heard any real powers that he can exercise when he's president. So. Uh, that is that that is one there are two crap deals on the hill that's one of them and that's the state of play uh you know uh as distinct from the last time we talked it's 
advance further, but we still don't know what's in the bill. There's a woman named Rosemary Jenks, who's the lobbyist for a, a group called Numbers USA, which is the most powerful restrictionist group. And she's sort of a no bullshit person. And she says, she, she says she knows what's in the deal and it's crap. So I tend to take her word for it. Um, so you think it's not, you, you think it is that the deal being offered to the Republicans is genuinely not satisfactory to earn yeah, a restriction. There are things, there are things that would be so important that it would be worth even taking some of the responsibility off of Biden's shoulders. If he said, I'm, I'm willing to have a mandatory E-Verify system where all businesses have to check their employees, uh, you know, to see if they're legal or not. That would be worth that would be worth, uh, you know, caving and agreeing to the deal. Uh, uh, and the caving isn't bad. I mean, I support more aid to Ukraine, so I'm not troubled by that. I just don't want a, a fate, a bill that takes Biden off the hook and doesn't do anything. But that would be that would do something. Uh, so there's that. Or if he if he. Um, if he reinstituted the Remain in Mexico program, which worked under Trump, it was, uh, uh, you know, you, you can you can pursue your asylum claim just as you could in the USA, but you have to do it on Zoom from Mexico instead of while you're in the United States working where you will never leave. Uh, that would work. So that would be a big thing, too. Uh, and maybe the Republicans will get that. I mean, they have all the leverage here because they don't really want to give money to Ukraine anyway. So but but at, at the moment, the press is pressuring poor little Mr. Johnson uh, and saying, oh, you have to cave because the mighty Senate has decreed that this bullshit deal is the deal uh, and he is rightly resisting. So you're predicting that, are you predicting that there will be a deal? No, the, no. The, if you want, the, 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 the overwhelming odds are that there won't be a deal, but there is a sliver of possibility that there will, that Biden, the, 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 the other two possibilities that Johnson will cave or that the Republicans, the Democrats will actually cough up some substantive reform after it goes to the House. And maybe there's a joint committee negotiating between the House and the Senate on some uber compromise that compromises the compromise. It's possible that Biden will cough up something significant. So I would say 60 percent it fails, 15 percent uh, Johnson case and the rest uh, Biden gives up something important. Yeah. Um, uh, but so what, what? So wait, all to bottom line, what are the chances that Ukraine aid does wind up going through? Um, uh, 40 percent. Hmm. Because Ukraine. Well, they could also, they could, also you know, they, they could also there are various ways they could try to put up. Uh, just put a straight put a straight Ukraine vote on somehow. Uh, you know, to up and down for Ukraine without all the border crap. Uh, and it, but they're getting increasingly well, desperate. If they could do that, they would have done it, all right? I mean, well, probably. Um, they're, they're, there's one strategy that they haven't tried, which is, uh, but if you're a desperate Ukrainian, you will try anything. Uh, Johnson right now has a one vote majority, okay? Yeah. He actually has a three or four vote majority, but Scalise is out six. Somebody else has gotten in a car crash, okay? All it takes is one car crash, and he doesn't have a majority. Two car crashes, and Hakeem Jeffries is Speaker of the House. Uh, two sex scandals, and Hakeem Jeffries is Speaker of the House. So, you know, right now, let's suppose... There's an oppo file on all the 217 Republican congressmen, or however many there are, and the Democrats have been holding off uh, publicizing some scandals because there's mutual assured deterrence. Republicans have scandals on them, and if there's all-out scandal war, there'll be many dead on both sides, and it's not clear uh, who is going to win. Well, so they're holding off. Scandals but, sufficiently explosive to get people to leave office before the election. Yes. Yeah, so it would have to be this a scandal so Mickey's, bad. This is just Mickey's paranoid brain working overtime. Not paranoid. Uh, well, paranoid, but some notable paranoids. But not overtime. How's this theory? Why does Speaker McCarthy resign instead of holding on to his seat to preserve the Republican majority? But he didn't care about the Republican majority, obviously. So his his seat is, is not a safe seat. Uh, the election could go either way. So... 
you know, there, there's a distinct possibility that before the end of the year, anyway, just through the course of death or car crashes, uh, that Johnson will lose his speakership. Uh, and there's some evidence that some people don't care about that. So he's close to the edge already. And if you're Ukraine and you think Ukrainian and you think your nation is, is at stake, you're going to go through those oppo files. And in, in 270 people, what do you think the odds are that uh, one or two of them have a career ending scandal in their oppo file? I would say the chances are pretty high. And the, the general rule is don't fuck with the Ukrainians. Uh, and uh, so th that is an option. I so think, you think that, they're behind this. Or th they... That's an option that, that is oh, undiscussed. See. So it's Ukraine. Uh, you think Ukrainians are behind the plot to uh, reveal? No, but if you were a patriotic Ukrainian, you would get the hell. You're, you get yourself behind the plot pretty quickly. It's your best. It, it may be your only hope at this point. Man, they are. I'll tell you, they are in trouble if the funding doesn't happen. But I still uh, think you may be. I heading. can't believe that Biden can't reass reassign funds and give them surplus arms and, you know, blah, blah, blah. And I'll, yeah, you know, I what did, understand what did, that. He, he uh, what did, yeah. What, I, what did what did Roosevelt do with Lend Lease? I mean, let private let private actors amass funds to buy arms and give them to Ukraine. Uh, there's things ship you can the do. The third countries overseas and have the private actors buy them there and ship them to ukraine i mean i can't I mean, believe this doesn't work around it's enough of a problem for ukraine that we're, that we're sending all these artillery shells to israel i mean above all what ukraine needs is artillery shells um i don't know how many we're sending to israel we're sending some uh so um um so anyway welcome to the grassy knoll uh i as you know i'm now a champion of conspiracy theories Be well, being um, I remain in, in the JFK assassination rabbit hole. Uh, well, I mean, the Republican House members are falling pretty quickly. Hmm. I mean, aren't they? I mean, they, they seem like they're... Do you they're, think McCarthy's... Yeah, there was something behind his choosing not to hang on to the seat? I don't think. I think he wanted to make a lot of money quickly, and he yeah. didn't want to do what Pelosi is do, doing, which is slog on as a backbencher when you've been Speaker of the House. Um, but... Uh, but there are people, and I talked to some of them in Iowa, who have the conspiracy theory that there are Republicans who don't want Johnson to be speaker for the rest of the year. Hmm. I didn't know there were any conspiracy theorists in the Republican Party. I'm surprised to hear that. Um, so let me get an update on an answer to a question I've already asked you. On the immigration thing, um, right now it sounds like the restrictionists just really aren't getting satisfaction. But is it the case that if Biden gave it to them, something that should, in theory, please them, then they would decide they don't want to give Biden the, the, the credit in the general election for having actually done something about immigration. Is that a some thing? Would, that... Some would, some wouldn't. When this started out, uh, the people, you know, the restrictionist lobbyists said, hey, maybe there's a chance to actually accomplish something here because we hold all the cards. Mm -hmm. They want the Ukraine, they're going to have to come through with something. Uh, and I think those people, including Johnson himself, would be for taking a substantial reform in exchange for Ukraine. I mean, Johnson nominally wants Ukraine it anyway. Um, there'd be some, you know, some people on the, the on the in, on the right who who's, who exist by resisting and you know demonstrating to the world that they're resisting and calling for shutdowns at the drop of a hat, and mm -hmm. uh, they would resist. But I, you know, the the big players are saying they will bring down Johnson if he accepts a crap deal they're not saying they'll bring down johnson if if he accepts any deal even a good one and they're not saying he should call off negotiations so i tend to think there'd be enough republicans to let johnson bring it to the floor where it would probably pass in a, on a you know one of those center votes where are there are enough republicans and enough democrats in the center to pass it and the fringes oppose it okay. uh, now uh, so Yes, I think I think the deal could go through. Back to I don't think it's going to happen, but I think it could go through. One more question about presidential politics: Is it how likely is it that the if it's Biden versus Trump, which it looks like it will be, um, that it comes down to whether RFK takes away, well, first of all, on balance votes from Trump, which I guess is the closest to the conventional wisdom, as said he hurts hurts Trump. 
Uh, every every poll shows nationally, RFK Jr. helps Trump. Really? With RFK, yes, with RFK in the race, uh, Biden is losing by more than. That's right. Yeah, Biden. Biden is losing by more than with RFK out of the race. We are but in screwed. swing states, that may not. Ah. The debate is whether in a few swing states, RFK actually hurts Trump. Well, also, and people will people come to Trump, know RFK better. I mean, most people answering these polling questions have no idea what RFK believes about anything. They they just have not paid that much attention. Right, but there's the no, George no, Wallace. R, remember the George Wallace R, RFK Senior crossover vote. They were the same voters. So if you did, do nothing, they're basically Trump people. Wait, the George so, Wallace RFK? angry white working. Wait, elaborate. The, the, so you're in, saying in 1968, George Wallace uh, was the third party. RFK candidate. was shot and killed. Right after winning the California primary, and Wallace was in the race. And where did RFK's voters go? Did they go to Hubert Humphrey? No, they went to George Wallace. Shockingly, to many people who thought Wallace was a racist enemy, RFK voters uh, supposedly liberal you know, unracist people voted for, for Wallace because they were angry white working class people even in 1968. Uh, it was a precursor of Trump. So I mean, also, now we actually have Trump and uh, and there's a natural affinity between RFK junior voters. Either they know nothing about him except that he's Bobby's son and Trump. Well, there was also a, more of a tradition in the South then of not voting for Republicans. It was still more Democratic, although less so than before the Civil Rights Act. Um, right. But I think it, I bet these polls were also for northern states. Um, but maybe not. So, uh, yeah, well, that's not good news for me if uh, RFK helps helps Trump. Um, so, uh, and the other thing... It, it, Anyway, Trump could kill this uh, border deal pretty instantly if he if he denounced it. You know, if if we saw the deal and he denounced it, I think it's dead. Maybe not. Uh, but um, so that's that's the main reason it's likely to die. Mm. Uh, there's also a very bad deal on the not uh, not quite as bad, but bad deal on the refundable child tax credit, where there's a. Uh, uh, Ron Wyden, Democratic senator and uh, a, a Republican committee chair named Smith have cooked up this compromise where the Republicans get a lot of business tax cuts and the Democrats get an expansion of the child tax credit that still has a work test, i.e. you still have to work. The, the work test is you have to earn twenty five hundred dollars in one year, which isn't a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, but it cuts it in half and says you can also use it for next year. If you don't work anything next year, you can look back to the previous year and then various people are saying, you've cut the work test in half. This is gonna encourage some people not to work next year. And uh, so that's where we're, we're having a debate about that. And I'm hoping that provision gets dropped, but there are all sorts of people who are on the on the right, on the sort of uh, reformicon right, I guess, who want to show that they care about workers and they care about income inequality. So they want to send these checks to, you know, to poor Americans and, and they're overlooking the, the disincentive effects of cutting the work test in half. And I think that's very bad. So the, the, the two most interesting things in my world are happening in Washington, not in New Hampshire. Do you notice how stoically I endured that? Like when you brought up refundable, Child tax credit. I didn't even flinch. Did you see that? That's because you were preparing your very intelligent question, which you're not going to ask. Well, what, what, what's an example of what an intelligent question would be? Can you do the honors for me? Um, um, give up, Mickey. You've lost. That would be an intelligent question. You mean on the uh, tax on the on the on that issue well, they, or on the tax credit? Is the is a um precursor for the reason they like cutting the tax credit and work test in half because then they can come back later and get rid of the other half and the result is a universal basic income for anybody with kids and then they can move forward and have a universal basic income for everybody and you would say mickey you've lost the robots are going to displace all unskilled workers and they're all going to live on the ubi and maybe it'll 
AI will displace a lot of skilled workers, and they're going to be on the oh, well, That's definitely the expectation. And, check out, I'll and, tell you, another reason to check out the non-zero newsletter, I would point it out in this issue that uh, two things that came out this week. One, at the high skill end of the ladder, there was this, you know, Google unveiled this like doctor bot thing that in these tests did better than actual doctors at diagnosis. They had they had like people kind of acting like they were patients chatting with it. And then they assessed like the bedside manner and rated that. But then experts assessed how good the diagnoses were and the doctors the doctors, there were three conditions, doctors alone, doctors using the AI as guidance, and then just the AI alone. And that's the order of quality. The worst was doctors alone. Second worst was doctors using AI. The best was the AI without the doctor. Okay, so that's a high skill into the ladder. But, how did, how yeah. did, but they, they should have decided whether the diagnosis was right by following it over time and seeing what the people died of. Well, these no. were not real people anyway, but there are there are also increasing there, there are more and more studies uh suggesting that radiologists for example people who read you know x-rays and mris they're just going to be out of work i mean it's, it's just getting better and better and i think it's to the point of parity and they're just going to be out of work now low skill end of the ladder sam's club is starting to implement these ai systems it's like image recognition and so on at these uh, at the exits, that's going to put all the people out of work who now just check receipts. You know, people stand at the doors and just make sure you got a receipt. They're out of work, and that's a I just not went, exactly I just a high skill a, job. I just went to a Walmart and I was looking for the person to check my receipt. And nobody did. Is well, that just because in in New Hampshire everybody is so honest they don't need door checkers? I don't think I've ever gotten that at Walmart. I, I but but um, I've got so Sam's uh, Club is. Sam's Club is more downscale, so they have to check the receipts. Well, or maybe more valuable individual purposes. I don't know. I, I don't know. They do they do this at Best Buy. But the point is, that's a low-skill job that can be done by AI. This is going to be like an earthquake, I'm telling you. AI is going to be a total earthquake, not just okay, in terms of employment. It, it's it's, uh, it's going to be well, big. Um, well, this, this brings us to my transition. Oh, good. What are we transitioning to? Um, well, you know, Nikki Haley is really an unappealing uh, uh, candidate, especially for her foreign policy views. She says, to me, uh, yes. if Israel doesn't need us, we need Israel. If if uh, if Putin wins the Ukraine war, he's going to invade Poland and NATO. Uh, that's why we have to defend Ukraine. Mm. If we if Ukraine beats Russia, that means China doesn't invade Taiwan. So we have to support Ukraine. Yeah, a bunch of very blobby bullshit views. Yeah. You know who funds the worst? Big funder of the worst. Koch brothers? Reed Hoffman, a man you just had a conversation with. Yeah. Funds I did. The, I wish I'd known that. Fund, I, I wish I'd known this then. Funds I Nikki Haley, the New York Times story about it. He gave her like millions of dollars. Uh yeah, it's not about the foreign policy, though. It's just about keeping Trump from being president. She gets a lot of that kind well, of stuff. Well, yeah, but so what? Well, yeah, I mean, look, uh, you know, no. I, I Do I wish uh, opposition to the blob were much more widespread than it is? Absolutely. I'm quite aware that there's a reason they call it the blob. It's everywhere. He probably is well aware that Haley is blobby. But, you know, he may be creating a Frankenstein. Well... He doesn't agree with me on foreign policy, probably. Who does? He doesn't. Why would he? Who does? I don't, because he agrees with you, because he's swayed by your logic. Actually, the podcast, we even disagreed on We even disagreed on AI. It was a good conversation. I listened uh, to the conversation, at yeah. least up, up, until, up until the very end when you started talking about, which was probably an interesting part of uh, what was behind the Sam Altman firing and rehiring at uh, OpenAI. Yeah. But um, I had, I had reactions to it. Go ahead. First, he's a very nice but somewhat bland guy. He doesn't have a lot of bite to him. You want him, you want him to have more bite? Yes, because... Maybe he, I should have uh, provoked him more. That would have been good. Uh, he, um, his, basic, his basic attitude is, uh, well, we can, we can say, oh, there's these horrible 
problems with the AI without stressing the positive things that are going to come out of AI, which he doesn't like. And his attitude is we should uh, we should pursue AI while negotiating the pitfalls and potential dangers. But he gives no faith that this negotiation is possible. Uh, you know, he just says, well, we'll negotiate it. Well, nice try, Reed, but what makes us think, uh, you know, the people that built the Boeing airliners are going to be able to, uh, or even smarter people are going to be able to negotiate these dangers, which he admits are real. Yeah. Uh, and so that was, that was my main, my main takeaway was he had to defend his optimism about being nego- able to negotiate through the AI rapids. And the second thing is the one the, he did, he was very short on positive things that are going to come out of it. I would say it's going to cure cancer. We're going to live forever. We don't have to worry about the birth dearth because we're all going to live to 200 and that'll supply all the people we need. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, instead he said, well, people are going to have this doctor assistant in their phone and maybe the doctor well, that's will a give real thing. I mean, that, that's a real benefit. It's bad news for doctors, maybe employment wise, but th- yeah, that is a it, real benefit. It, but it, 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 you say, OK, doctor and a phone versus wiping out all humanity, which is more important. Well, he doesn't think yeah. it'll wipe he, out all that's humanity. The, that's the argument he has to make, and he's not making it. No, he doesn't accept the premise of the extreme doomers. His... Sorry? He, doesn't, he does not accept the premise of the extreme doomers like Yudkowsky. And I, I don't, I'm, I'm agnostic on their scenario. And he, he does not think the risks are as big as I do. But he but thinks he, there are risks of bad actors using this technology to do things like wipe out humanity. It's mm-hmm. just the, there's less of a risk of uh, the technology autonomously deciding to wipe out humanity without any bad actors in it. Right. He doesn't he doesn't buy the rogue, you know, the rogue super intelligence uh, takes over the world thing. Right. Um, right. well, he, yeah, he thinks the risk now, all the benefits you mentioned, he does, he's certainly aware of them. He, he wrote a book uh, called impromptu. He had access to chat GPT four before the rest of us did, because he was at that point still on open AI's board. And he used it to write a book about all this stuff that came out right about the time chat GPT four did. And all that stuff's in there. Um, do people know who we're talking about? We're talking about Reed Hoffman, founder of LinkedIn. Yeah, well, that's the other thing I was going to say. And also, by the way, founder of in, uh, Inflection, which has this AI bot called Pi, which is interesting. People should check it out. P-I, Pi.ai. Um, I, but yeah, the, no, the 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 one, re, you know, what I wish I had, one thing I wish I had said, he was kind of complaining about how few optimists there are on AI. And it is an unusual case where, you know, uh, Capitalism has failed to do adequate public relations. You look at the public opinion polling and you look at it over years and anxiety about AI is much higher in the public than it was two years ago, four years well, ago. And my, my point is he's exhibit A of failing to make the positive case. If he was making the public case, he would go, here are the 10 earth shattering advances we're going to make with AI. Okay, well, we're going to end kind of, cancer. We're at gonna, this uh, point, if... if you know, if you're immersed in this world, you assume everyone's aware of all the upside. And and I was asking the questions, you know, I to some extent I was steering him away from that. He but had many opportunities to do it and he didn't do it. He talked about this dock in a box. OK. Dock I, in your box. You know, honestly, I, I think it may also be partly that I know him well enough that it was more like he was having a conversation with me. And he knows I know all this shit. So I don't know. I mean, uh, but but let me I do want to say one thing. I wished after, you know, when he said, you know, name some people are being optimistic about AI. And I kind of conceded there aren't a lot. But in terms of the public's uh, skepticism, you know, a lot of this is a consequence of the way social media worked out and the way Mark Zuckerberg was telling us it was going to be wonderful and it turned out to be the opposite. And I think maybe one reason, I mean, I'm sure Reed's aware of that, but I, but, but one funny thing about him, is he created the only non-toxic social media site I'm aware of, which is LinkedIn. You may or may not like it, but it, but it's it's why, not like a hot bed of bad shit. What? Why is it non-toxic? You said that. Why is it? You said that on the show, and I was wondering why is LinkedIn non-toxic? I, it's just not well, but because well, it was established as a place where 
people use it for professional purposes. And and I think it has remained largely that. I think there's more, maybe more political discourse on it than there used to be. But it just, you know, it's partly because of the how the conversation was constrained. Um, like I don't even know what is what is a LinkedIn conversation. It's like, hey, I'm out of a job. Does anybody here know any job openings? Is that like uh, a LinkedIn conversation? You know, it's I, I, look, I don't spend much time on it. I, I'm not in the kind of profession where, you know, I'm I'm not like trying to get myself new jobs and stuff or trying to hire people or whatever. But um, I I think it's it's a little more it's probably a little more self-promotion y than well, everything's full of self-promotion. But I mean, you know, people are like getting their brand out. They're personal, this is what I do for a living, this is why I'm would good you go at on it. I, why would you go to a site to learn about other people's brands? That's what I don't understand. It sounds like hell. Well, it's worked. I mean, he, he sold it to Microsoft for a lot of money, and that's why he's on my... Well, uh, it's a, not a direct consequence of the sale, but he is on Microsoft's board. Um, do, do people say, hey, got any company secrets you want to leak to help me out with this problem I have? No, it's like networking. You know, networking is a big part of professional life for a lot of people. It's like the place where you do the online network for the professional dimension of your life for a lot of vocations. Yeah. I don't know. Okay. Um, anyway, I thought in, in this, his AI pie has a sort of touchy-feely positive aspect to it, too. And I thought it, it sort of like nudges you in the right direction if you're angry and sort of doesn't help you. And uh, it, it seemed it, it made me want to write a dystopian science fiction novel where the villain is not an evil AI chatbot, but it is a friendly Reed Hoffman like AI chatbot who's somehow in all of his friendly guardrail heavy advice saps human life of all its vitality and interest. Sort of a, a right a, a sort of AI version of Fight Club, you know? We're all controlled by this wonderful pie and we're at peace and anytime we're angry it calms us down so we don't have rich human interactions and get the pleasure of getting really angry at somebody and then Get them getting really angry and us having coming to some sort of rapprochement because everything is stopped by the pie chatbot friend before it happens. <laughs> um, I don't know. It seems it seems suffocating to me. Uh, well, maybe you should try. Have you tried it? No, I'm too angry. <clears throat> what? I'm too angry. Maybe I'll you should try it. it before you write your novel. But um, I hate that the, Nikki uh, Haley person. I hate her. It's going to say. Yeah, I mean, on balance, I don't I think you have do. to worry about AI having that effect because, and this is something I brought up, the incentive of the average AI company will be to just maximize engagement, and social media has taught us how you do that. You just play to people's prejudices, make them feel good in the easiest way possible, and that reinforces their cognitive biases and leads to. But he isn't life. going for he is he is. I thought he said on your show he is. Not going for engagement. Yeah, he is more thoughtful than he many, and, and he is more genuinely what he is thoughtful. Going. I don't know what he is going for, but it's he is he is genuinely uh, more thoughtful and uh, philosophical. In fact, he majored in philosophy, I think, in college than the average Silicon Valley billionaire. I I've learned how to not care about engagement. In other words, every time I write something that's mildly critical of Trump or mildly positive about Biden which is not often, uh, my traffic goes down and I lose followers. And this doesn't bother you if you don't have many followers to be with. So. Wait, it's every time you write something that's what? That's, oh, that's if I write not something that's outside my brand. In other words, if I right, right. Dump, on, dump on MAGA, uh, yeah. dump on Trump. I have a lot of tr people who follow me who are Trump followers, even though I'm not voting for him. Uh, uh, but um, so when... If I criticize him, they they drop off, they they cancel, they, they my numbers go down. Yeah, I'm increasingly post, uh, uh, I'm and, increasingly but, indifferent to feedback. Uh, yeah, it's, but I, if 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 you have nothing to lose, you have nothing to lose. So that's my solution. For example, what did somebody say to me today? He said, uh, "Damn it, it was something like I'm so disappointed. I've been a follower of yours for." A long time, but I'm so disappointed in you. 
it, he's not I'm angry really about sad. 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 It's what yeah, it's 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 more out of yeah. Um I had been kind of casual in uh what did I do? There was this tweet. Oh, I needn't bore you. Somebody wrote a country where the choices between Biden and Trump is in a crisis of unfathomable pr proportions. And I quote tweeted it and said, unfathomable may, may be a bit of an overstatement, but yeah, basically this is true. And this guy was upset with me for saying that we're fucked. Uh, now, it's true that the guy who I was quote tweeting was quote tweeting me. It's a long story. But anyway, um, we're in a bad there place, is one, Ricky. There we're is, one, bad place. There is one, one ray of hope. What is that? I need it. You know who Trump it. is considering for his vice president? You? They're, they're usually, they're, most of them are all terrible. Uh, Tim Scott's not up for the job. At least Stefanik it seems like a genuinely evil opportunist. Tim Scott's applying uh, for it. He applied today or yesterday when he endorsed Trump. But go Stefanik's ahead. Stefanik's been applying for it for, you know, a year. She doesn't even make any bones about it. Uh, Can I make but, a prediction? Um, My prediction is I will not be nearly as gratified by whoever it turns out to be as you think I am going to be. Who is it? You're gratified if they're good or bad. Oh, well. Uh, oh, that's a tough one. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I thought you uh, meant it was somebody I, that relatively friendly to my I ideology. Could save the nation. J.D. Vance. Is uh, you're aware is that I don't like J.D. Vance, right? I know. So what I meant it was semi ironic but you will learn to like J.D. Vance because he's the best of the bunch. What a sad comment Complete, on the bunch. Completely, um, no, he's completely up to the job. He's a solid character. He's a complete pander to the worst of populist sentiment. He's a complete pander. He'll say anything. He's worthless. He engaged in bipartisan rail safety talks when there was an accident in, in his state. He didn't. Well, good. Because, you know, Mickey, when people ask me what issues are at the, the top of my list, I always mention rail safety. But I'm so worried is, about being on a train that crashes. His instinct was to be constructive, not to hurl epithets at the Democrats. Constructive the, on a completely milk toast issue that, A, nobody gives a shit about, and B, there's no controversy over what so fucking ever. It's not completely milk toast. There's an argument that Republicans deregulated too much and it's instead of having two people on every train, they had one or something like that. And, and we needed to re-regulate. And that's a big issue. Anyway, I, one thing I wanted to, I meant to say last time when you said Bobby Kennedy could be Trump's running mate, it hit me only too late that you first heard that from me months and months and months ago. I was stealing it from either Bill Scher or Matt Lewis, I forget, but you did hear it from me first. And you went, hmm, not bad idea. Okay, I believe you. I don't think it'll happen though. Uh, but um, uh, I, I'm looking for renewed respect for Cornell West. But uh, I like Cornell West. You know, I had an office next to his at Union Theological Seminary. In fact, there was an adjoining room. Our assistants occupied the same room in between. So we each had kind of office suites because we were like important guys. Uh, why aren't you running for president? You know, you're not. The yeah. first to ask that. Question. You the, I, do you have I asked glad handing skills? Yesterday. I think I think you do. I don't think I'm a natural politician, but I think you have more glad handing skills than I do. But this is how bad things are. I would give Biden a run for his money. Anyone. This <laughs> is the weird thing. This is this is no, this crystallizes it. There are so many people who could give Biden a run for his money, and so many people who would be Trump. Folks, there's an opportunity here. Come on. Um, we were not. We, there, there is a name out there that we are not thinking of. Look, these names. Might I've, I've named. Might the, be Bruce Springsteen. Uh, no. The, but the um, no, the names are not the problem. The problem is finding the names who would run. No, again, right. Again, again, so Tim Kaine somebody who's could knock off Biden, knock off Trump. In his fucking sleep. All it takes is like a is like a normal sentient human being. Probably somebody who Biden sort of pissed off on his climb up the ladder, except he climbed up the ladder at age 29 and hasn't left. Um, well, it, uh, again, I mean, it's it's like, uh, you know, 
Chris Hayes wrote a book called The Twilight of the Elites, I think. And I, I'm not, uh, I didn't read it, but I assume that it's about what has actually happened, which is that- I read just, it fast. It's about how we don't have a real meritocracy anymore. Um, mm. In fact, the danger is that we might actually have a real meritocracy and it would be the nightmare of Michael Young's uh, uh -huh. The Rise of the Meritocracy. Uh, so oh, he missed so it's not. So never mind then. Missed, but what you I missed, you missed the point. What is what is like what I increasingly realize is that cohesive and coherent societies need some degree of elite cohesion. Uh you think it's bad that the chairman of Boeing can't stop uh air doors from falling off and uh jumbo jets from catching on fire and the head of United Air is a performs as a drag queen on special occasions does this sap your faith in the elite man now i'm not sure where the segue was there but uh oh i see does this have my faith in elites no well, I mean, the, one, of the, one of the big raps on elites now is we boeing used to be the best air company in the world and through uh successive generations of capitalist success it's now badly managed and its airplanes crash whereas an industrial policy company Airbus, a socialist company, not a capitalist company, is beating the crap out of Boeing and its airplanes do not fall from the sky. I'm on board with the moral of that story, but, uh, I mean, I guess, but what I'm saying is that there needs to be some degree of cohesive power held by elites for societies uh, to function minimally. Well, I'm just saying like the Democratic Party, you need a party where when everyone agrees that the incumbent is a disaster, they do something about it. They can do they, something about well, it. Well, the, the cohesive elite is the blob. The blob is a cohesive elite. So you, the blob should have power to get rid of candidates. That's a good point. The blob is the only cohesive yeah. elite. The only cohesive elite community we have is the one who 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 is that is destroying the fucking world with with uh, terrible foreign policy. That's a good point. It's, um. What is the relationship between Davos, which is going on now, and the Blob? The Blob is a subset of Davos? It's a foreign policy wing of Davos oh, or not? It's a mystery why global capitalism is not more anti-Blob than it is. Um, because you would think that, that, that capitalism would want to make the world safe for itself and create a stable platform. This has long been a question of mine. I think maybe there was a time when that happened, when like the Council on Foreign Relations was a little more of an extension of Wall Street. And that has its downside if, you know, capitalism controlling foreign policy. But if they emphasize stability, they sure as hell wouldn't support what American foreign policy has been. And remember, um, stability often is synonymous with peace and instability with tons of people dying. John Ellis made one good point about Trump. This is a different point that, mm -hmm. than your point is, uh, but I, I just you reminded me of it. Trump, Trump, and this is he he's drawing on some articles by McKay Coppins about going to Trump rallies. Is the Trumpist movement is now uh, has has taken on a mind of its own. In other words, people go to the rallies, they listen to Trump, but they don't really listen. They leave before Trump has spoken. It's not about Trump. Mm -hmm. They are the they are the Trump blob now, uh, that you know Trump is riding back into office. But if if Trump dies, they they're not going to go away. Uh, they're 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 still there, and they they have a certain degree of independence from Trump. Uh, so um, that's interesting. Previously, it yeah. was, uh, you know, he was like Perón, right, or. Maybe the Peronist movement had a mind of its own, but uh, uh, it was a you know one man politics, mm -hmm. and it's not anymore. It's a it's a coherent group in the Amer in American democracy that you have to deal with. No, I think that's true, and it's easy to miss that because Trump does have such control over it right now. But it it sort of controls him. I mean, there was the famous incident, um, you know, my my greatest. My greatest hit when uh, when uh, Trump as he's very unreliable on immigration. He could go either way. He's very unreliable on the refundable child tax because he loves to send money to people. 
He thinks he buys their vote if he sends them cash and they'll love it. And he's probably right. So um, he could go either way. But there was a time when he wanted to sell out on immigration and people started burning their MAGA hats. And there were only like two or three of them. But they were on the web. And one of them was me. <laughs> and uh, and and th- he was Trump was intimidated by his followers. You know, oh, I can't piss these people off. They're going to start burning their MAGA hats. So it's mm-hmm. not like he controls it with an iron fist. No, it's the same with actual dictators, too. Nobody, there's no such thing as a true autocrat. There was a um, a big book written by a guy who was a big Trumpist, the guy who wrote uh, the Flight 93 election. That guy. Mm. He wrote, was he at the Claremont Institute or something? He said the Claremont. He, he didn't write the book. He, he wrote a, his name an then? essay about the book. The book is about the Emperor Cyrus, who apparently was the most successful person at ever building an empire that they actually did control that didn't control them. Um, So the metaphor is that like you're voting for Trump and yes, you know, it's going to like be the equivalent of the airplane you're on crashing, but you still have to do it. Is that it? Oh, the flight 93 election was the flight 93 was election. If we elect Hillary, it's disaster. So, so we we'll have to bring the plane down. Is Flight 93 the plane they brought down? The yes. let's roll plane? Yeah. Yes. So we yeah, let's roll with Trump because the, the end result we'll destroy, is that we'll, otherwise, we'll the, plane is gonna, for us, otherwise the plane is going to crash into the Capitol and kill every member of Congress. So, yeah. Uh, you know, well, I'll was, tell you, I am uh, increasingly, I, I think, fatalistic isn't the word, but I think we're in such a mess. I mean, in so many ways. I mean, American institutions are completely ill-suited to governing in the in the current technological climate, and I don't see how they get revised to become, you know, to adapt. I I just don't see it. I I and in general, and the world is totally fucked up, thanks in no small part to American foreign policy, and there's all these tribalizing dynamics, and increasingly. I just, it's like, I don't really have all that strong a preference. It, how do I describe it? It's like, you know, sometimes you just behind. decide what, like the future is so uncertain. It's like for things to work out well, something dramatic is going to have to happen and it may have to be very painful for a while, right? So you, and th- you're becoming a, you're becoming a Lee Kuan Yew type autocrat where you want no, 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 I'm just talking about, I'm just, I'm just saying, you know, in, in past elections, I've always had like, like a strong preference usually, you know, and I really think it matters. And like, I really think Obama's better than Romney because his foreign policy will be better. And so, and Obama will be better than Bush, uh, which he was and, and so on. And now I just think like, we're so fucked. It it it's hard. It just seems like recovery is sufficiently is sufficient is enough of a long shot that it will happen through some unexpected path, and it may be a disastrous Trump four years that has to happen, and it may be something else. And I just don't fucking know. What I do know is that the answer is not RFK Jr. or Nikki Haley or Joe Biden, or Donald Trump, or, you know. Uh, so I'm just and, like fastening my seatbelt. And and I, I'm just going to, you know, express my version of what I think the problems are and what I think our values should be and what the challenges are. But it's, it's not looking good. I'm sorry. There are a lot of people who agree with you. Like yeah. everybody I talk to agrees with you. So. Well, yeah, but a lot of them think they have the guy, right? Like a lot of Trump. No, think, they all think. No, they all think we're in this horrible dilemma, and there's no way out. Yeah, but it except, isn't just this presidential. I mean, it's not just Biden versus Trump. That is a horrible dilemma. But uh, it's uh, uh, it's they are they are just symptoms. They are just symptoms. They think the problem is Biden versus Trump, but they don't there's, have a solution. They, Biden and Trump are symptoms of something deeper. So, so if you got if Biden and Trump were replaced by the 
president of your choice, why would we still be hurtling towards catastrophe? Well, oh yeah, I, I could identify a set of policies that would that would uh, straighten things out. I mean, look, I do care enough to. I don't want Trump to be president. It's just that Biden, given what we've seen of his foreign policy, given the fact that he is too old, and given the fact that if he dies, we get Kamala Harris, um, it's just Biden, you know, I would vote for Biden over Trump, but it's just, it's not so clearly superior that I care as much as I otherwise would. And I can imagine I guess- a scenario where four more years of horror with Trump which it would be, are are somehow a. Pe- it's like the way World War One gave the gave way to the League of Nations, World War Two to the United Nations. Like big reforms tend to come in the wake of catastrophes. So the calamity will be cleansing. The uh, I think um, well, it's obvious what the long term horrible trends are. So yeah. AI, meritocracy, disease, terrorism, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so I guess I shouldn't mock that. I, uh, I wouldn't. I wouldn't sign into all that. But but, yeah. You could you could go for a bolt hole. What's a bolt hole? Look for a harmless third country where you could move to while the worth while the world falls apart. Become a prepper. Yeah, that's a that's a form of prepperism. Yeah. Yeah, Costa prepperism Rica. is expensive. You need money to prep well. Okay. Um, well, you can make money by selling prepper goods to preppers. That's Plus, a better idea. You give them not only the not only the the, the tents and the and the you know the 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 uh, dried beef jerky, but you will also sell them the ideology that tells them why they need the tents and the dried beef jerky. Excellent idea. Uh, uh, you can become the L. Ron Hubbard of preppers. Like every every pack of beef jerky has inside it a little guidance from me or on the wrapper it's like it's like it's like that uh it's like the dove chocolate wrappers peppermint soap you buy doctor somebody's peppermint soap it has Mm. one world slogans Mm. you would agree with that soap you should go you should invest i'm gonna go get some now um so yeah i'm I'm through all my um bullet points yeah, well, then unless you want to talk about the JFK assassination, it's time to go because that's all I've got left. Can you can you give us three sentences on what you think the solution to the JFK crisis is? JFK conspiracy. I think it's a little late to come up with a solution <laughs> since all the people who participated in it. If well, it you was think a it's thing, the mob, dead. you think it's the latest solution is, which I think you hinted at, is that. A secret serviceman behind him in the motorcade accidentally fired his gun. No, I didn't think that. Who thinks that? Apparently, that's serious? a common theory. Oh Jesus! There's so many crazy theories. And the guy took the the guy is taking the secret to his grave, or already took it to his grave. I think an underappreciated fact is that con- conspiracy theory isn't entirely synonymous with multiple shooters. You can imagine uh, rogues in the government, in the CIA, having kind of steered Oswald toward this and just thinking, hey, if it works out, great. If it doesn't work out, I mean, if, if their goal was indeed, uh, well, partly they hated Kennedy, but but also to blame uh, uh, an ostensibly pro-Castro guy for it and thus start a war with Cuba, they'd be like, well, oh, what's the worst that can happen, you know? So he misses. <laughs> you know, it's like um, so. So there, it doesn't have to have been more than one shooter. I would say that. On the other hand, nope. that said, the, the shooting itself is completely. There are these contradictions I just cannot resolve in terms of the the evidence about the shooting itself. Um. Well, you're you're um. RFK Jr. might be your candidate. I assume he's. I assume he's bought into this conspiracy theory too. Oh, yeah, I assume. I mean, I think I told you that he remembers uh, his father, RFK, right after the assassination. Some CIA friend of theirs comes over and 
and Bobby said to him, tell me your people didn't do this. And the guy says, I, I don't know who did it. But 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 the point is that his father's Bobby Kennedy's suspicion was. Well, that's a completely rational reaction to have as your instant reaction. Mm -hmm. The question is, 20 years later, do you still have it? Up? I mean, was but, Bobby. But, was Bobby, uh, Bobby Jr. there when his father was killed? I doubt he was there. He, 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 he would have been still probably what, like a teenager or something. I don't know. But the, um, but, but, but one thing, you know, Bobby was still attorney general when the assistant attorney general this is right after the JFK assassination, Nicholas Kotzenbach wrote this memo that we now have that basically said, you know, in white house memos, like, okay, this is the story. Americans have to be convinced. Right. There was one shooter and blah, 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 and, and and that he would have been convicted if he had lived and blah, blah, blah. I mean, there's just no doubt that the Warren Commission was set up in an atmosphere of like, this is our story. We're sticking with right. it. Right. Um, and Bobby and Bobby, I, I think, would have been. Uh, probably fine with that, because part of the whole motivation of tamping it down was to keep the right wing from turning it into an occasion to wind up in a war with Cuba and even the Soviet Union. I, I, I applaud that motivation. Um, uh, what would Glenn Greenwald say? Uh, huh. he, he would say you're, a, you're, you're part of the problem. You're willing to lie for your cause. I, I am part um, of the problem. So, Mickey, I can tell that you don't share my fascination with JFK assassination. Time to no, wrap I this thing up. I, I think our viewers may not, might not share the fascination. And Mickey. I also, I used to I used to be heavily into it. It was like, there was this oh. comedian, Ward Saul, who had a show yeah. in, in LA, a talk show. And every week, he'd have a new Kennedy conspiracy person on. And I became very fascinated with it. And he became so fascinated, he eventually moved to New Orleans and went to work for Jim Garrison. As oh, a Hollywood comedian. So that's how into it he was. But um uh so you know, but I just see that's forgot. the thing. I never Go went ahead. through the phase. I never went through the phase. In fact, I now can't believe I was in college in Fort Worth for a year, easy drive to Dallas, never went to check out the site. Amazing. I never I ne I just I mean, I remember the assassination, but I never I never got into the, I never got into the rabbit hole. It's such a great you rabbit should, hole. You should shake. You, 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 somebody should do a, a rating of all the great rabbit holes. This is the best. There's <laughs> so much shit out there, and you will never get to the bottom of it. But if you go and, to, if you actually go to the school book depository, it will winnow down the field. Oh, I've out. already, I've already ruled out a lot of shit. Okay. Um. Uh. Yeah. So, anyway, if people. If people want a special, you should invite somebody like Mike Isikoff on who, uh, who knows yeah, all about. I doubt he's brushed up lately. I mean, if he was he like, yeah, no, I, 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 I would like to have a conversation with someone who would an, could answer all my questions. He's, uh, he's written but, a book about Fanny Willis. So who's she? A See, prosecutor I, prosecuting Trump for uh, the Atlanta, you know. I want you to find me six thousand votes or whatever that is. Oh yeah, um, and it's the head. The book is titled "Find Me the Votes." I think. And Fire in New York pointed out today that at no point in the transcript does Trump actually say "Find me the votes." He says, "I just, I just need, need X number of votes." Well, yeah. yeah. Well, that's a pretty subtle fucking distinction, Byron. Thanks for sharing. Um, the <laughs> the uh, the um, wait. What did I want to say? So is Ron DeSantis. Uh, no, but I, I, my point is that's not much of a distinction. You take, you take a point. That's not much of a distinction. No, I like Isaka, so I'm glad that the headline of his book is, uh, is justifiable. Um, the, uh, last question. So is one reason DeSantis is hanging around, uh, and may hang around for a long time in your view, because who knows Trump could wind up in jail and enough voters could say, was well. There was one poll that showed Trump losing like 20% of his support if he's convicted, which right. was stunning. I, 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 I can't believe that. That's stunningly high, in my opinion. But it's possible. And, and who that, knows whether they'd follow through. But on yeah, and who knows what the conviction will look like, what it look legit, what it look not. Uh, so 
but there's enough of a chance that it'll have an effect that it's worth sticking around. And also, he just all he has to do, you know, he's he can run in 2028. He's mm -hmm. the, the conventional wisdom is he's just running to groom his to have an off ramp and groom his path to 2028. And you know, if he if he does the Robert Mitchum thing in 2028, he's home free. Uh, there ain't gonna be no 2028 for this guy. <clears throat> Sorry. I, I just think this is his last run if he loses, and he's going to lose. So DeSantis. No, I don't. Why should it be his last run? Because he's a famous failure. Everybody is uh, the one. The the one thing that can gr bring America together at this point is the consensus that Ron DeSantis is a terrible fucking candidate. <laughs> Everyone agrees. What if he? Well, first he's getting better and better. What if he retools and? Finds Jesus and and becomes emerges a, a new man reborn like a phoenix from the ashes of his old campaign. Uh, I think he, that plus plus the unkept hair, yeah, I could do it. Okay. Um, and you know, and you know, maybe a an inch higher heel, maybe. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That would look good. He would look good in heels. Uh, you know that that was a, that was an issue in the campaign that he actually wears lifts in his shoes. So does Tom Cruise. Works for him. But, and, you know, and if the Ukrainians come up with dirt on every other politician in America, it's like... He's he's home free. It's like, you know, would you go out with me if I was the last person on Earth? Maybe. The answer is yes, we would. All right. On um, that note... Okay. <laughs> Um, this was you. epic. This was epic. There's nobody listening at this point. You, so you can say anything you want. Is there anything even that you want you don't want anyone to know? Go ahead. Have we got over two hours? No. Uh, we're right at two, I think. Okay. Good place to stop. Yeah. Uh, okay. It, yeah. When you when you uh, are you going to follow this thing? You're not going to Nevada for the caucuses, no. No. Last time I did because it's right by L.A., but where I live, but. Uh, you going down to South Carolina after that? No. No, so you're done. This is the end of your Hunter Thompson phase. Correct. Uh, you know, I mean, it, it, New Hampshire used to be the last place where all the reporters in the world could get together in one place and schmooze, and it's not even that anymore. You, you so. have discovered that it's not that. Okay. Or maybe they're all in a secret speakeasy. Like, you know, you know that in Des Moines, there was a secret speakeasy under the hotel where all the big shots were. I didn't know that. And I I actually discovered it and it wasn't that exciting, but there were big shots there. And so maybe there's a secret speakeasy under the, you know, residence inn in Manchester where, you know, everybody's trading trading secrets. But well I have I'll let you I'll let it. you go I'll let you go find out now. Uh, do check in if there is. Let me know. Okay. Uh, I will uh, and I, I think they're all in the metaverse probably. So you should check there too. Uh, doing unspeakable things to each other, yeah. Which you um, can, again, no one is watching or listening. You can speak him if you want. If you if you're thinking of specific acts, no, no, between consenting adults, go ahead. Nope, 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 nope. nope. Okay. Um. Okay. Uh, we'll, we'll see you in the next uh, campaign. Mickey checks in from in the next verse. Yes, from the campaign verse. Yeah. Okay. Okay. See ya. Yeah.